On behalf of the Patient Safety Authority, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled Building a Culture of Safety, a Journey to High Reliability. My name is Kelly Gibson and I will be your moderator for this program. Now I would like to introduce our speaker for the webinar. Ann Miller is a Senior Patient Safety Specialist at UPMC Presbyterian Shadyside. As a Patient Safety Specialist, Ann promotes a culture of safety across two hospital campuses by encouraging incident reporting and event transparency. Ann leads several dual campus initiatives, including a Good Catch program and a newsletter focused on patient safety entitled The Safety Pin. Ann received her certification in patient safety, CPPS, in 2018. Prior to working in patient safety, Ann held several roles at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, including Operating Room Clinician and Interim Director of the Operating Room and Procedure Center. Ann also has experience as a staff nurse in the Operating Room and in the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit. She has a bachelor's degree in Health Policy and Administration from Penn State, a bachelor's degree in Nursing from Duke University, a master's degree in nursing administration from Penn State and is currently pursuing a doctorate of nursing practice at Carlo University. Anne, I will now turn the program over to you. Thank you so much, Kelly, for that great introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I move into my content, I first wanna take a moment to thank the Patient Safety Authority for this opportunity. Obviously, I would have loved to have been in person with you all um, at P2S2 in April, but obviously the world had other plans for us. Um, but I think it shows so much uh, of the, the, um, the value that the Safety Authority puts on patient safety throughout the state um, to be able to take the time to flip this to a, a webinar content that way we can all interact with each other in this way. So thank you all very much from the Safety Authority. And secondly, thank you all for being here. Um, I know in our post-COVID world, um, got finding a free hour or a free 45 minutes can be really difficult. So thank you very much for, for leaning in today um, to learn about the, the, the journey that my organization has been on for the last three years. I'm thrilled to share this content with you. Our objectives for today are very simple. Um, I wanna start with um, recognizing the value that the Culture of Safety Survey brings to a healthcare organization. Um, we're gonna just talk briefly on this because I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, I know that many of you might be new to, to patient safety. Um, we're all at different stages of this safety journey, um, this journey to high reliability. So I wanna make sure that we're on the same page there. We're also gonna discuss three initiatives that enhance the safety culture. Um, those are the things that we've been building over the last several years here. And I also want you to walk away with an initiative that you can implement in your care area tomorrow. Um, I don't think there's anything worse than sitting through a 45 minute presentation and not, um, not being able to walk away with anything useful. So I really hope that by the end of this, you take a, a piece of this webinar or a piece of a part and say, you know what, I can do this tomorrow. And um, that's really what I'm hoping that you can take away from this today. If you've never heard of UPMC Presbyterian Shadyside, I wanted to take a moment to um, talk through my organization. We are located in the heart of Pittsburgh at two hospital campuses about two miles apart. UPMC Presbyterian is the larger academic medical center of the two. It's a 758 licensed bed facility. It's a level one trauma center, a world leader in transplant. We are also beginning our magnet journey on that campus. If you hop in your car and drive two miles down the road, you'll hit UPMC Shadyside. It's 481 licensed beds. It is a three-time magnet recognized organization, which we're immensely proud of, and a world leader in cancer care. Both hospitals are under one hospital license for the Joint Commission, um, which is its own challenge and I think its own separate webinar in itself. Um, but each campus is unique and it has its own culture and its own personality. And it's really important as we go through here, um, I'm gonna show you some of our culture of safety scores um, from the past several years. And each campus is actually scored separately. So I will share those scores on separate slides um, and you can see how each campus kind of has its own unique, unique scores. I would also be remiss if I didn't take a moment to recognize my incredible team. I might be the one standing here today. I'm actually standing, I'm not sitting. <laughs> I'm standing here today um, talking to you about um, all of the, this great work, um, but it is, it is only done because we have such an incredible team. Um, the six people on the screen there, in addition, our administrative coordinator, um, Michelle Hill, 
um, who isn't pictured on the screen. But what I also want to take a moment to say is that if you are a team of one, which I know many of you are, um, you're an army of one out there wearing um, a half a dozen hats at the same time, um, please know that when we started these initiatives, this team looked very different. Um, there were really only two of us at the time that were pushing these initiatives forward. So please do not be overwhelmed by the fact that these are being pushed forward with a team of six. Um, a lot of this can be started with just one or two people. That's how we started several years ago. So with that, let's jump into the culture safety survey. So what is a culture of safety survey? Um, it does just that. It assesses your patient safety culture. So it enables organizations to see how staff perceive aspects of patient safety within the organization. Um, we use our safety survey to wear, raise awareness, um, diagnose and assess our culture, um, identify areas of improvement, so on and so forth. The, the, um, what you can do with your safety survey is really limitless. At Presbyterian Shady Side, we use the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, or AHRQ, tool. This includes 42 items that measure 12 domains of patient safety culture, and it asks questions like, um, we are given feedback about changes put into place based on event reports, management provides a work climate that promotes patient safety, the actions of management show that patient safety is a top priority, so on and so forth. They're pretty gritty, gritty questions. <laughs> They're pretty, um, pretty impactful questions. Um, they are also, the survey items have been demonstrated re to be reliable and valid. Um, I am certainly not promoting one specific survey um, during this presentation, and there are several other valid and reliable surveys out there, and they are listed there on your screen. So what does the safety culture survey look like at Presbyterian Shadyside? So in 2017, we completed the full culture of safety survey. I'm gonna share those results with you in a moment. And following that survey, there were a lot of areas of opportunity and they kind of all folded up into three domains. There were common threads that were able to roll up in one of those three categories. Supervisor action promoting patient safety, facility management support for patient safety, feedback and communication about error. So in 2019, we completed a pulse survey to reassess just those three focus areas, and we're gonna walk through those results as well. So what did 2017 look like for us? So as I said, Presbyterian and Shadyside will be on two separate slides. So at Presbyterian, um, you can see our scores weren't, weren't stellar. Um, the, the purple bar on the left is the 2017 score. Um, the gray polka dotted bar is the AHRQ 50th percentile mark. Um, the 80%, 73%, and 69% boxes above that AHRQ 50th percentile means that 80% of the organizations were meeting that 50th percentile box or, or marker. Um, you can see that at Presbyterian, we just were not even to that 50th percentile mark. Shadyside doesn't look much different. Um, scores a little bit higher. Um, in each of those domains, but certainly um, areas for improvement. So basically, we took these results very seriously um, in our department. I remember sitting at a conference table with just the, the several of us that were in the department at the time with the scores laid out in front of us going, we, what are we gonna do? <laughs> we need, uh, clearly our staff are giving us a message that we are not promoting a strong culture. We don't have a strong safety culture here. We need to take a step forward. Um, and the initiatives that I'm going to present on the following slides are, are what we developed and what are still in place today. Our first one is the patient safety tip program. Um, this program identifies trends and patterns from, from event reports. So I know all of you out there um, can identify trends and patterns in your event reports, right? Every, some, this week it's hypoglycemia, next week it's, uh, you know, aspiration events, the, the week after that it's, you know, um, surgery concerns. There's always a pattern. I don't know how that happens, but there always is a pattern. Um, basically, we review the events that come through for our patient safety committee meetings, look at those event reports and identify those trends that pop out at us and develop a one-page flyer um, to show best practices, um, the correct process, maybe it links to a resource, um, and based on those event reports. So I'm gonna show you an example on the next slide. We send these out um, to 
in an email to leadership as applicable. So maybe it's just for, you know, nursing, maybe it's something for our medical providers, maybe it's something for our dietary staff, so on and so forth. We make sure the right leaders um, receive that information. So that's an example of our, actually three examples of our patient safety tips. So you can see that they are very clear, um, there's not a lot of words, and um, we try to make sure they're very visually appealing. Uh, if this is something that you're interested in taking forth in your area, um, I, I have some pearls there at the bottom of the screen. Um, the first is that accuracy is key. Um, in tr tr uh, true transparency, full transparency, um, one of our first patient safety tips was shipped out into the world um, with inaccurate information on it, um, and the world was set on fire. <laughs> um, so make sure that when you put together these tips for folks, that you are making sure that the information on there is, is accurate. So whether that is sending that tip through legal or maybe your um, risk management team, or it needs to go through nursing education, so on and so forth, um, to make sure that everybody's kind of validating that information that is accurate. We also use a standard template. You can see that all three have kind of the same feel. Um, I would highly recommend that if you are not using some sort of standard communication tool or templates for your patient safety communication to start doing that. Um, it's something very easy. Um, it doesn't take a lot of time. These are actually PowerPoint slides that we kind of adapt into um, the tips. Those are, it's very easy to do. When you set that standard of having those templates and having everything look a certain way, um, people come to expect things from you. Um, they, they, they actually reach out to you and say, hey, can you make me, you know, one of those really nice tips? Can you use that format for me? Um, the BMDI um, tip on the far left of your screen, um, our informatics team actually reached out and said, hey, we're having this issue. Um, can you make us one of those really nice templates and one of those really nice tips that we can use? Um, and these have been shared um, as screen savers and other things like that. We also provide recommendations um, to our leaders for distribution. So maybe it's something for care management. We'll put in that email to leadership, hey, um, this is something great that you can, you know, laminate and put by your care manager care, your care manager station. Or, you know, this is something about discharge, make sure it's by your admission team nurses computers. Or put this by where the pharmacy is, share it in your safety huddle. You know, print this out and put this on your, your table for your staff meetings. So when you share things with the leadership on how to actually use the tool and use the tips, um, it really goes a long way. These have been really successful for us. Um, and we actually have a lot of leadership that actually reach out to us asking for them. Um, and, and we get a lot of great feedback when we do send them out. Our second initiative is a good catch recognition program. So this is um, probably nothing new to, to many of you, and many of you may already have something very similar out there, um, but ours is a little bit different. Our program is not based on nominations, and I think some of the literature out there um, will give you some different information on whether or not a nomination-based program is the way to go. Um, at the time, we just didn't have the capacity, and we probably still don't have the capacity, to man another, uh, another station. So there was no, no one could man an, an email inbox or a hotline or uh, you know, a paper mailbox with nominations in it. We wanted to use the tools that we had. So what we have is a risk, uh, risk master, our event reporting system. So we run a report in our event reporting system, and we pull out those good catches monthly. Um, in my mind, I would rather have those good catches in that event reporting system for tracking and trending purposes rather than in a nomination-based system. In my mind, some, if I'm going to uh, put in a good catch, I'm going to do one, one thing, right? I'm, I have enough time to either, you know, send an email or call the hotline or enter it into the event reporting system, and I would rather catch those in that event reporting system. So, again, we run that report, we pull them out monthly, and we recognize four or five people per campus with those good catches. Um, we send everybody a gift card. Um, everybody loves Starbucks, so there are Starbucks gift cards for $5 a piece. Um, and we also send an email to, our, to the person who is being recognized, and we put their leader on that email. Um, it's a really nice opportunity for the leader and the, um, the staff member to, to connect in that way. Um, and quarterly, we will um, choose one good catch over the last three months that has had the most impact 
to patient safety. And we will celebrate um, that particular person on their unit or in their department. And on my next slide, I have um, some great pictures of our Good Catch programs and our Good Catch recognitions. So you can see that we've actually had banners printed. Um, those are, they hang like baseball pennants. You can see the middle picture there um, with the string. And we've had several units who have won more than once. So they actually hang them like baseball pennants on their unit, which is really cool. Um, we invite everybody and their brother to come celebrate with us. That picture in the middle there is, on um, the top middle picture is Sandy Rader, our chief nursing officer um, for Presbyterian Shadyside. The bottom picture is pharmacy. Um, there's lots of pharmacy leadership in that picture. Um, we celebrate absolutely everything. Um, when we started this program, um, someone actually approached me and said, well, I don't understand. You're, you're just recognizing people for, for doing their job. And I said, you know what? I don't know if I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, we are recognizing people for doing, for, for doing their work. But when you reward people for catching something before it reaches the patient, when you reward somebody for, for using that reporting system and promoting a culture of safety, that rewarded behavior gets repeated. And we have, um, we, we're not keeping track of this currently, but in the past, we have kept, tra kept track of the increase in the reporting of the good catches since the inception of the program, and that has increased. Like I said, we haven't kept track over the last year or so, but for the first year, those reports were increasing. So that behavior, was, that rewarded behavior was repeating. Um, we, again, use the tools that are available to us. Um, we do not, um, don't have the ability to man another, another nomination system, so we have what we, we have. <laughs> um, and everybody loves food. <laughs> um, I put that in kind of as a joke. If you we were in person, hopefully you'd be laughing with me. Um, but the picture on the far left always just makes me smile. This was on our Presbyterian campus, and that's our dietary staff. And they had a tremendous good catch um, with a patient who had left um, pills on the on a tray and they walked out of the room recognized the pills were still on the tray and and, and found the nurse to make sure that the um, the patient received the medications they were supposed to and when we went to plan this um, this presentation for them we thought well they're dietary are they really going to want food like that doesn't make any sense they're, they're around food all the time um, and the supervisor was like oh my gosh no they really want food um, they, they they're always delivering food they never receive food themselves so we, um, we always bring those star cookies that you can see that they're holding in their hands. Um, and they were just over the moon excited that we brought them food. So um, it's really extremely heartwarming and those, those presentations are always um, really well received. And finally, our feedback to reporter emails. This is probably our biggest lift and the initiative that I am the most proud of. Um, this is direct communication back to our event reporter. So the previous two initiatives are definitely some indirect um, and some, some indirect um, communication and indirect feedback. This is a direct communication back to that event reporter via email. Um, I have done lit literature searches until the end of the earth to try to figure out the best way to provide folks with feedback after they submit an event. And every literature article will tell you, and if you can find one that says something different, please send it to me. My, my uh, communication is on, the, on the, the last slide, and I would love to hear from you. Um, what it tells you is that people want feedback, they, but nobody ever tells you how. Is it an email? Is it a face-to-face -face communication? Is it a phone call? Is it, a, is it an RCA? Like, how do people want to be communicated with? So at the time, we just started with email. Um, that's kind of the resources that we had at the time, and we just went with it. Um, we st send about 20 to 30 a month per campus um, based on criteria. So that criteria is completely just what we made up on our own. Um, we started very small, and we only sent emails back to event reporters um, who had reported serious events or Sentinel events. That's a pretty small bucket of people. So after we kind of got a few under our belt and we felt pretty comfortable with the workflow, we've been able to increase those event reports to um, any event that hits our patient safety peer review committee meeting agenda. So it's uh, quite a few. We also vetted this verbiage through legal prior to starting the program. Um, it's never a bad idea to consult your legal team before you put anything out there um, into the, the interwebs. So we, um, 
we definitely um, vetted that verbiage through them and they approved the program and were great, great supporters of our work. So those are two examples of our feedback emails. Um, you can see they have that great, great template there that we just started using. Um, and they have some, some canned verbiage, but there's definitely some spaces um, to, to put in some really robust information in there. Um, I will tell you that the biggest thing, the biggest pearl that you can take away from starting a program like this is to be really sensitive to what you're putting in these emails. And also, this should never be a task that you just need to get done before you go home at the end of the day. Um, staff put in reports into your reporting system um, because they're really upset about something that happened. They want someone to be aware of something that happened. And getting a very flip response on the back end really turns people off. So um, I will give another very transparent example of an email that I sent um, after an event occurred in our GI lab. And it was in a rush and I just wanted to get done for the day and I needed to get these feedback emails done. And I sent the email and within about five minutes, I had a call to my cell phone from the physician who was highly upset with me about my flip response to his event. And I talked to him, we talked through the event, talked through what had happened, I apologized for my verbiage. Um, and, we, and we worked through that but it was a really nice lesson to me that this is, this is very serious to folks and it's just, you know, quote unquote, just an email for us, but it really is impactful to our staff. We also use a standard template. Um, you can see that there are internal communications department did a really nice job making these beautiful templates for us. I will tell you that if you don't have an internal communications department where you are, um, we, we started with just an email. It was just an email and we put it in UPMC purple and we ran with it. Um, there was no fancy template. So you don't have to start with something like this at, at all. Um, we also copy the leaders on the email. So whether it's, we put our patient safety officer on there, um, that, that person's unit director or their clinical director or their, you know, their attending so on and so forth. So it also gives that, that leader the chance to connect with that individual. And you, I think you'll see how, how well that has worked out for us um, when you see our 2019 data. I will also tell you that the, um, the first year of this program, we also connected this email to a survey. So there was a little survey monkey link in the email and we asked people um, if they liked this feedback because again, we had no idea if people would really like being connected in, in this way. And we didn't know if people would rather have a, um, uh, you know, a per, a in per, in person conversation, would you rather pick up the phone? Um, is email really working for you? Um, we had a tremendous response to that survey. We kept it very short. We only asked people if they, if they enjoyed this program, if they enjoyed getting feedback this way, and if they had any suggestions. Um, I think we received about 100 responses to that, to that, um, that survey. One person told me they didn't like it. 99 people liked it. Um, I never found that one person. I'd like to know who they were. I'm kidding. Um, and so everybody loved it, and they were thrilled to get feedback. Almost overwhelmingly, the responses were, I've never received feedback in this way before. Thank you so much. Please continue to do this. So it's been um, an overwhelming success for us. So since 2017, we have sent over 40 uh, patient safety tips, and this deck was made actually back in January, so these numbers are significantly higher now. Our Good Catch program recognized over 200 staff members. I think we're up to like 250 at this point. And our feedback to reporter emails, we have now just crested over 1,000 emails sent directly back to staff members. So how did we do? Did this make a difference? It absolutely did. So at UPMC Presbyterian, um, now that dark purple bar in the middle is that 20, the 2019 results. Um, you can see that our results went through the roof. That facility and management support for patient safety going up 12, almost 12 points. Um, I want to take credit for the majority of this. I know there's a lot of great work that goes on out there, um, but I think the, the Good Catch program, having the leaders visible, responding to those emails, approaching their staff saying, hey, thank you so much for entering that Risk Master, um, has really made a really significant difference. UPMC Shadyside had a, also a very similar response, increasing in all three domains. 
that facility management support for patient safety with a seven point increase. So I realize I've talked very fast <laughs> and I'm sorry, but um, I buzzed through this a little bit quicker than I think I anticipated, but we'll have lots of time for questions. Um, our next steps for, this, for these programs, um, right now a lot of our patient safety tips end up being um, very inpatient nursing focused. Our ORs and our ancillary areas um, deserve their own tip and their own program. So we're working on how we can best reach those folks with um, a, an outpatient ancillary focus tip. We're also, we're always reviewing that good catch program to see if there are better ways to do this work. Um, is a gift card really the best way? Do we, uh, I know one organization that um, has a great program that they have a luncheon for their folks every year. So it's something that we might look at moving forward. Um, when I made this deck, we had just started using those email templates. Um, we have still continued to use those through the year um, and they have um, received really great feedback. And, and more. Um, we just started a, um, a newsletter in the last um, six months that has received a great response, and we're always looking for better ways to do this work. So in conclusion, if you are, have you been a safety specialist or worked in patient safety for 100 years, or this is your first day, I highly encourage you to just start. Start somewhere, whether it's sending one email to one staff member to say, hey, thank you so much for reporting this event, and this is what we did with it. Um, be consistent about what you do, um, whether, no matter what program that you start and what program you decide uh, to, to, to work into, um, make sure that you, can, you consistently do that program. Um, you know, flip-flopping and not being transparent, um, our staff see that, and, and they know when things aren't consistent from a leadership perspective. I also ask that you be really flexible with yourselves. Um, starting something new and, and starting a new program can be really difficult. And if something isn't working and you need to tweak it and start doing something a little bit differently, please do that. What's important is that we are getting back to our staff, closing that loop so they know that the, the work is being done on the back end. And with that, um, again, I realize I may have talked a little bit too fast, <laughs> um, but that is my contact information. Um, I highly encourage you to reach out to me um, via any of those modes there. I am very responsive and um, would be happy to walk you through or share any of our templates. Um, we are all on this journey together um, to make patient care safer. So please um, reach out to me and I, I'm happy to help you through any of the, any safety culture questions that you have. So thank you very much. Thanks, Anne. That concludes the slide presentation portion of our program. Now we would like to begin our question and answer period. So we do have a couple that have come in. Um, the first question, how do you decide which event reports get an email? So can you maybe describe the workflow that you have um, in place in order to develop and, or get to those emails? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a great question. So, um, when we first started, um, we were sending um, all of our, any event that um, was sent out for serious event determination or was determined serious. So that was, um, we would, you know, work up the event in whatever way that we do, send them out to the patient safety authority, the Department of Health, obviously, um, kind of wrap up that event, whether it was an RCA, so on and so forth, we would wrap it up with a bow, and then that as the last, like, check mark on your checklist of things to do for your event, we would, we send that email out to the reporter, saying this is all, you know, the things that we did with this particular event, and then that event would be, you know, packaged up and done. Um, since we have kind of moved on from just doing serious events, we also um, will send the, the emails out for any event that's on our patient safety peer review committee meeting agenda. So our agenda has a list of, you know, the event number on the event description. Um, we look up the event reporter and um, we'll send out the, after the meeting, we will send that email out to everyone on that list. So, um, I hope that answers your question. Um, where we, we don't really reserve them. We used to reserve them just for really bad events, um, but not, not so much anymore. We, I think every event deserves um, you know, some sort of feedback. Yes, thank you. That, that, that is very helpful. 
Um, next question is, what is your distribution for the tips? So where do all those get, um, get emailed to? The whole organization or focus distribution based on the topic? Can you describe that more? Yeah, absolutely. The tips um, are sent out definitely based on who they impact. So if it is a, an issue with feeding tubes, um, that's really a, an inpatient nursing. Basically, every unit, you know, has somebody with a feeding tube. Um, it will go out to inpatient nursing. I will say that the majority of our tips end up going out to inpatient nursing. Um, we have um, an email listserv to all of our unit leaders, our nurse execs, um, nursing ed, and we will put, the, put it all under one email for everybody. Um, if it is really a unit-specific thing, um, a physician-specific thing, maybe it's just a surgical oncology physician issue. Um, I can't say we have a lot of those, but we would send just to that particular group. Um, I will say that if it's happening in one area, it's probably happening in, happening in a lot of areas. So the more places you share that information, the better. Um, it is just a PowerPoint slide. So we just share the PowerPoint slide and our units, um, if they decide to print them off, they just print off that PowerPoint slide. It's really easy. Um, we, ha we do have folks that send them out via like an end of week update, like a little newsletter for their, for their teams, and they will just copy and paste that uh, slide into their end of week updates and it goes out. Thank you. That's some, some good considerations. I think it's easy to, as our organizations have gotten bigger and a lot of layers, I sometimes, as you indicated, so you might miss somebody or not think necessarily of one department. So I, I kind of like the, that's some good food for thought. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Sure. How, I, and another question is, how do you trans, transform patient safety tips into sustained action slash education to future hires. So as you're bringing new employees on board, how do they get that communication? And looking at, do you um, put things into policy and procedures, those kinds of things? That's a really great question. And I think that's something that um, we struggle with. And I'm sure that if you're asking the question, then you certainly struggle with it as well. Um, sustaining that, you know, right, that right process and that right procedure is always, is always the challenge in patient safety, right? So a lot of that onus falls to the, to the, the, um, the nursing staff and that the nursing leaders, when they come into the organization, part of the, the glory of, um, pulling nursing education and those folks into these tips to help us make sure they're accurate is that they can take that learning forward when they do um, new nurse orientation and things like that. But again, a lot of this falls back to the unit director. Um, I know one of our unit directors, she loves the tips. She has them in, in, you know, in a binder. Um, they're a part of those end of week updates. And as the staff come on, um, she makes sure that she goes through them, but have us and patient safety, have we really owned that orientation process? No, but we put that information out there. We give them examples of what to do with it, um, and then we hope that it's moving forward. And I think Thank the last you. part of your question was whether or not it, um, if, if it's moving or if any of them connect to any policies. Um, we will link to a policy in the tip. I'm not sure if this is answering your question or not, but we, um, will, if one of the questions or one of the concerns in the reports were about um, a policy issue or that clearly we weren't following the policy, we will link um, directly to our online infonet um, so that the staff can go directly to them if they need to. And maybe the flip of that, have you ever had to make additions to policies and procedures based on some of those tips that have come out? I would probably have to say no because the, the, the tip is the standard, right? So the, the event report comes through with this happened to me or this happened to my patient. And when we dig into that report, we see, you know, we have a deviation here. We have a deviation of what really should have happened. So that tip is really your best practice of what should have happened, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Very helpful. Thank you. Another question is, why do you need legal to review your emails to staff? Is there a liability issue? 
There isn't, um, but we want to make sure because we're not, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um, we kind of question whether or not we should um, put MRNs or date of birth or, you know, patient information into those emails. Um, and emails are, can be pulled by a plaintiff attorney. Um, I'm not, please, I'm not a lawyer. I have no, I do not have JD after my name. So, you know, consult your own legal departments um, with, with any particular questions. But we wanted to make sure that information that we, was, we were putting out there, um, if it would be pulled um, in a court case. And we wanted to make sure that they um, had the approval um, of anything that we were doing. We work very closely with our legal department. And um, you don't usually use the wor words warm and fuzzy about lawyers, but our lawyers that we work with here are really warm and fuzzy. <laughs> so I have a really nice relationship with them. Um, so we did reach out to them to say, hey, this is a program that we're going to start. Do you foresee any issues um, down the line? And they were really supportive and they said absolutely not. Are they reviewing every email that goes out on an ongoing basis or how, maybe the question, how often do they get involved with reviewing the content? Um, they don't, they don't get involved at all. I'm assuming they meaning our lawyers. Um, they do not, yeah. they do not get involved at all. Um, it, when we also have not had any cases that have come back that they would have need to pull those emails, um, but they are not involved in the day-to-day -day operations now. Thank you. Have you looked at unit safety scores? Um, somebody is indicating that they have distinct spread in the culture data by unit. Um, and so how do you help kind of focus in one, one department? Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And if um, we were doing this presentation in person and COVID didn't exist, I probably would have told you that we were in the process of digging into unit specific data at that time. Um, that was on our radar um, was to look at each unit individually kind of do a, a, an analysis of how many event reports they have, how many times we've reached out to them through these programs and what their scores are going to look like on the back end. Um, we right now have not had that latitude, but that is something that we are actively pursuing in 2020. Thank you. In finding that you did, you know, your level of communication or the way you communicated with this email, um, did you look at other ways to get that communication out, such as attending committee meetings um, or yeah. other? Um, how did you find that that was the best way to get to frontline staff? So when we started these, um, the email was um, easiest for us, honestly. Um, like I said, in 2017, when we started these programs, there were really just two of us that were doing this work. Um, and the amount of events that were coming through was obviously way more than just the two of us. So we, um, the email was the, the path of least resistance, and it was how we felt that we had the most impact and that we could start immediately. So that's why we chose that. We also attend our shared leadership conference, our um, committee meetings as patient safety members. Um, we are very transparent with our staff. We go to unit-based council meetings. We go to our quality and safety council meetings that share leadership structure. And we share events in that way as well. Um, so they get a lot of, the, our frontline staff have a lot of face time with us as it is, but for that individual nurse, there's almost 5,000 nurses between Presbyterian and Shadyside, um, and to meet them one-on-one -on -one was just not something that we felt was feasible at the time. So we started with those emails, and they've been so well received that we have just um, continued with it. Thank you. It is challenging communicating with uh, frontline staff across the facilities, and it can be very yeah. difficult. So we, we often resort to emails, but do you see challenges with staff not um, being able to read them or not knowing they receive them? Yes, yes. Um, we used to put a read receipt on them, so we would actually see when staff opened them or didn't open them. Um, I think putting that leader on the email, too, is kind of that missing link. So if you can't, if you aren't able to tell if the staff have opened the email or, or, or reading it or truly understanding what the content is, that leader is the backup. And our leaders have been really great about approaching the staff or they, they either they'll send an email or they'll tell me like, oh, you know what, you know, I saw Bobby in the hallway and I said, I, I thanked him for, for reporting that event. 
So making sure that the, the leader is aware that they are, um, that they submitted this event and they received that email um, kind of helps bridge that gap a little bit. Thank you. I know those are some good um, tips for people that are, may, might be thinking about moving something like this forward. Um, another question is, did you have a system-wide rollout of notification for staff, or did they learn about the program through just being nominated or contacted? Yeah, so we took this show on the road before we started any of these, any of these programs. So way back in, oh, it would have been the summer of 2017, we had a, a nice little slide deck that we took everywhere. Um, it went to every shared leadership council, it went to our patient safety peer review committee meeting on both campuses. It went to, um, I believe it actually even went to our medical exec committee meetings um, to let them know that these things were coming down the pike. Oh, we also have a management forum, which is every manager on both campuses. We presented these programs there as well. That way they knew that these things would be coming to them um, and to encourage you know, the, the leaders to participate, to encourage their staff to put in risk masters or submit those good catches those type of things. So we did not just, just put this out blindly. Um, we, we had a lot of advertising. We also get a lot of help from our internal communications team as well. Um, they um, put things out in the day, it's called a daily extra. It's just like a little newsletter that goes out every morning to everybody's inbox. They put a lot of information out there um, for us as well. Thank you. Another question, maybe shifting gears just a little bit, how do you choose the event? that are reviewed via um, the peer review committee. So how, what is your process around referring cases to peer review? Sure, um, it's a little bit outside the scope of uh, this webinar, but it's still a, a really great question. Um, between Presbyterian and Shadyside, we have over 3,000 event reports a month. So it's a, a, huge, a huge number. Um, so we actually have, in partnership with our risk management team, um, a, they kind of help us scrub um, the events ahead of time. So they will flag anything that looks really concerning that, you know, might have ended in patient harm, a trend that they're seeing um, from their perch, and then we will review those events um, and say, you know, this one, you know, we're seeing a trend, we're going to keep this one on for the agenda, so on and so forth. So um, it's, it's in partnership with our risk management team. Um, again, they, they kind of look at everything um, as a whole and, and, we, and then we drill down from there. Um, we try to keep events on, actually it might be easier to tell you what we keep off. <laughs> um, events that we keep off are um, blaming and shaming. So events that are very clear, you know what, I hate Dr. So-and-so, he's a jerk, and these are the 15 things that he does wrong every day. Those can't be solved in a, you know, a, a committee-based setting. We try to keep events on that, um, that we can solve, um, that have clear or clear trends and patterns, insulin pen issues, for example. We always put those on to make sure that people know that, this is, that we're having a problem here with those. Um, aspiration events, events that really ended in um, and ended catastrophically um, for our patients. They will keep on as well. Um, thank goodness we don't have a lot of those, but we, we keep those on. Um, event, events that are um, blaming and shaming, pointing fingers, he said, she said, those type of things um, we reserve um, for, for a different forum. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. So, um, it, it, in relation to your team, I know you kind of mentioned how many members are in your department. Could you kind of touch on that again um, in relation maybe to the size of your organization? I think it is, it might be um, overwhelming for some facilities that are smaller to think, how do we do all this work? And yet, you know, I'm a one man yeah. show or something yeah. along those lines. So. Yeah, absolutely. So our structure right now um, is that we have a patient safety officer who obviously um, is over both campuses. Um, we have a patient safety manager who also sits over both campuses. And then each campus has two patient safety specialist professionals, whatever you want to call us, on each campus. So for Presbyterian, that is two people for 700 and what did I say? 781 beds, now I'm forgetting my material. Um, 700 and, did I say? 68 beds, there we go, 758 beds. 
And then for Shady Side, it is two people for 481 licensed beds. So it is still, even though it is a very big department, it's also a very big footprint to cover. And in light of that, do you uh, do you have a medication safety specialist or somebody in pharmacy that is kind of your counterpart that you work alongside? We do. We do have a a um, medication. I'm not sure what her title is. It it's, has left my brain. Um, a medication safety officer or something like that. She does not report up through us. She is a pharmacist and reports up through the pharmacy structure. Yes. And so does that individual get involved with some of these safety tips as well in the Good Catch program? Absolutely. Or, or is Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, she um, runs the safe medication um, committee meeting. Um, we have events that involve medication issues. We um, reach out to her directly. Um, she helps us validate the information that's in the, um, the patient safety tips if they're pharmacy related. And we also um, will engage her for our Good Catch program as well. Absolutely. She's an incredible resource. Thank you. I know we talked a lot about a little bit about emails, um, maybe shifting gears. As far as the newsletter, how often uh, do you publish that? And what's your distribution yeah, again? Yeah, I, I would be happy to share that. Um, when I had made this deck again, it was kind of in its infancy. Um, but we started um, that newsletter, it first went out in January of 2020. Um, we unfortunately missed an issue in April because of a little thing called COVID, um, and our next one is set to go out in July. So we are planning for a quarterly distribution, um, trying to get something out every month just was an overwhelming lift for us. So we thought that a quarterly basis um, would be a really, uh, a really nice structure, and it has honestly worked out really nicely. Gives us plenty of time to um, put the content together reach out to people, give them a month to give us an article, things like that. It is shipped to every every single person that I have an email address for. <laughs> um, I think my last distribution, um, when I sent the one out in January, went to over 400, maybe 500 people. Um, that's physicians, nurses, it uh, you know, it doesn't matter who, it went to everybody um, that I could get my hands on. So it includes a lot of really transparent information. So we had uh, an event um, with a retained object, and there was some tr cr tremendous learning that came out of that. We had a two-page article on retained foreign objects and what to do about them. Um, we have a whole article right now on um, the lab quality group and all the great work the lab does, like kind of like the unsung heroes of the hospital, right? So have a whole article on them. Um, it's a great, actually in January, we had um, a two-page spread on um, what our event report trends look like through 2019. So just super transparent. Um, I also have to give a shout out to UPMC Pinnacle, um, who did actually gave me a lot of the ideas to start ours. Um, but I would be happy to share what I have um, so that you all could, could start something on your own. It's um, a ton of fun. It, it, I'm not going to tell you it's not time consuming because it's a little time consuming to make sure everything's out there, especially in a little bit of OCD like I do and everything has to be lined up perfectly. Um, but it is, oh, we also put our good catches in there. We put all of our good catches in there so that way all those folks get, get another a little bit of recognition. Um, and it's been a really big success. And um, when we missed the April issue, we'd only put out one issue in January. And the April issue was missed, and I had several people come up to me and say, hey, where's the pin? Where's the pin? I miss it. So, which really was really heartwarming and great. So, it's um, a great thing to, to add to your safety culture, for sure. Wow, that really speaks to the value of, of, of what your um, organization sees with that. And that's wonderful to hear. Yeah. I know you talk about um, pulling in maybe some content experts and making sure of the accuracy of that. So. Who else do you engage? Um, do you ever engage patient experience or other departments? I, I know you also talked about risk and um, legal, but who else are you pulling into some of this work? Oh gosh, it probably depends on the the event itself. So pharmacy, obviously, if we have pharmacy events, um, we're pulling in um, nursing education, risk management, um, dietary, nutrition, um, oh my, so every different department. Um, 
that you can think of. Um, I, I can't say we've engaged patient experience or patient relations. Um, this is not um, patient-facing content, so I haven't really felt the need to engage them, but I, I certainly would if it was something that I felt that their, their input would be valuable for. Um, I, I don't think that there's been a department that hasn't been touched by patient safety at this point, <laughs> whether, whether they like it or not. Um, they, we've reached out to them um, in, in one way or another. Oh, the OR as well. Um, our OR friends, if they, um, uh, if it's an event that's OR specific, we've reached out to them, um, you know, at making sure that they um, have their, their input as well, the lab too. The lab is a great resource, pathology, those, those folks. Like you said, I think it sounds like it really just depends on the content of, of what mm -hmm. you're doing. And yeah. some that the patient, patients themselves, having them engaged depending on what the topic is. Mm -hmm. How, it, it, I know that we, we've talked some about this good catch, and of course, everybody loves food. And But how did you get, justify initial funding uh, as far as the Good Catch Award gift cards and banners? Were executive leadership enthusiastic about the idea? Was there some hesitation? I'm sure right now, um, with everything that has gone on recently, I think the financial constraints are a little different, too, than what they were quite a few months ago. Absolutely. Yes, they are. Um, so if we take COVID off the table, um, because I believe our budget is approved through <laughs> 2020, so that money's already been allocated. I can't speak to what's going to happen in the future. Um, as of right now, um, it was certainly an ask of our executive leadership for those things to be printed and to have, um, you know, gift cards purchased and allow for reimbursement if we go out and buy gift cards ourselves. Um, we truly sold our executives on the value of the program. There is literature out there um, that you could, you know, just tons of literature on the value of a good catch program, um, that patient engage, or, or I'm sorry, employee engagement work, um, rewarding that behavior. And when you reward that behavior, um, that behavior gets repeated. Um, all of that great employee engagement. And then that it, the research on how when you engage your employees, how that engagement will then um, it can improve your patient outcomes. So once we put together a presentation on that and we're able to sell our executives on, you know what, this small, truly in the, in the, you know, the grand scheme of things, this small amount of money that we want to spend on gift cards and banners and cookies, you know, once a quarter is really going to go a long way and pay dividends. Um, nobody has asked us for any kind of business analysis or summary on whether or not, you know, the, the 20 bucks we're spending on gift cards is really leading to better patient outcomes. Um, we haven't had to do that. But I think once we were able to put all of this out there and they could see how much value it's brought to our staff and how much people love it, um, and then we get those executives engaged. Um, with those presentations. So I'm calling my CNO saying, hey, we're, you know, we're recognizing this PCT tomorrow. Can you come down? And she's there and she can see how excited the, everybody is about the programs. Um, it has engaged them as well and engaged them in a different way. And they've been extremely supportive. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I know we back to the newsletters a little bit. Um, how long mm -hmm. are the, you know, the longer sometimes you start to tune things so what is the length of your newsletter? Um, we have stuck to under 10 pages. And it's not 10 pages of straight content. It doesn't look like a novel or a book. It looks like a magazine. Um, so there's a lot of pictures. There's a lot of, um, it's, it's not just, it, it looks like a magazine. It, it does, it's not straight words. So it is, um, an easy, quick read. Um, we're trying to keep everything under 10 pages. That way we can keep people's attention. So it's not, um, when you hear 10 pages, I feel like it sounds overwhelming, but once you look at it, it really isn't. And it's colorful and it's bright and it, and it draws your attention in. Now, shifting gears again a little bit again, um, daily safety huddles, I know a lot of organizations are performing them. Does your facility um, have daily safety huddles? If so, how do you engage staff to discuss events? Many say nothing to report. <laughs> I, can, mm -hmm. I remember listening to where they go down through each department and they have nothing, nothing, nothing. So do you have criteria for the huddle? So we, we do, we do have safety huddles. We encourage every unit to perform a safety huddle um, at least once a shift um, so that sometimes depending on how often that you change shifts, it might be three times a day on a unit. Um, 
I will we and also when we rolled this out a few years ago, we also gave every unit a set of criteria of what you could consider what, what you could put in your safety huddle. Um, so that could be anything from skin care issues, you know, your high risk falls, um, issues that you've had, so on and so forth. So yes, we do. Um, I, I think that some, you know, and, and to be completely transparent and honest, we do. I think the, the the structure of those is very variable depending on your unit, and it really depends on how engaged your your unit leadership is to actually perform that safety huddle and how much value they see in it. Um, so I will use one example. We have a, our vascular unit here does a tremendous huddle around 10 o'clock every single morning, and they um, go through every patient. They talk about falls. They talk. They've had a, an increase in their pressure injuries. They go through all the patients that are high risk for pressure injuries and what they're going to do today to prevent the pressure injuries for those patients. Um, they've done a tremendous job. They haven't had any happies in three months since they implemented this. Um, they've done re really, really great work. As for getting people to talk about events and things like that, that is a journey. Um, that does not happen overnight. Promoting event transparency and moving away from a finger pointing culture um, does not happen overnight. Uh, I've been in this department for three and a half years and um, I, I have felt a physical change since I've come to this department, um, since I've been in this work we are slowly but surely getting to a place where people feel comfortable saying, oh, I reported that, oh, I, I need to put this for semester in, I need to, you know, let's talk about this in an open forum, and it's taken a long time to get there. Um, that is like the last slide that I shared about being, being consistent about um, how you approach things. That came, that transparency and comfort comes from our, my entire department coming to every shared leadership council with nurses and saying, let's talk, coming, walking up to them in, in the hallway with the same consistent, I'm, I'm not gonna, you're, you're not gonna be fired for telling me this. Um, that, and the, their physicians, you know, a little bit slower come around, but they're coming around too. And it's just that same consistent message, that same transparency every single day, day in and day out. And eventually they start coming out of their shells and, and saying, okay, let's talk about these events. This is the event that we had here yesterday but it's all about leadership transparency and the commitment to safety. That was a bit preachy, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I was ready to say, oh my goodness, yes, and stand up in the yeah. class. <laughs> um, but it, it's true, and I think that's what, in patient, as patient, patient safety professionals, a lot of us have seen that it's certainly, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time and consistency and hard work, and although we want to bear the weight of, on our shoulders, it takes a village. So it, yeah. it, it's a lot, and that consistency and continuing at it. I'm, we have time for one more question, and I would just like to ask, as maybe um, a one-woman show in my organization, it's just me, what do I do when I leave this web, webinar, and what do I, where do I start first when I go back to work? I'm going to give you two things, not just one. <laughs> um, one, the, the first is I would start with the feedback emails. Um, modify them to whatever you need them to be. So if you're not comfortable with an email and you would rather find that nurse or that tech or that doc and talk one-on-one, -on -one, start there. Start having those conversations. Um, start with one. Uh, that is the first thing that you can do. Uh, it takes, you know, a minute or so to write the email or make the phone call and thank them for reporting. And number two is that um, consistent, consistent, transparent message. Um, have that same game face on in every meeting and in every interaction that you have with every staff member, and eventually your culture will start to change. Thank you so much. You have given us a lot of food for thought, um, a lot of um, great questions from the participants on this webinar, and thank you everybody for taking the time to join us today. Uh, this webinar, um, I don't, maybe I should ask first, do you have any uh, final comments that you would like to close with, Anne? Um, I don't. Thank you all for your for your comments and your questions. My contact information is on those slides, and I um, am happy to connect with you um, outside of this webinar. Thank you very much for being so engaged. Thank you. This concludes our webinar.